Good morning, noon, or night, wherever and whenever you are listening, you are listening to The Shift. I'm your host. My name is Doug McKenty. This is episode 76 of The Shift, recorded on April 16th, 2021. Today on the program, I'm happy to introduce author, podcaster, and professional magician Gordon White. Gordon is the author of multiple books on the history and practical application of chaos magic, a spiritual path dedicated to communicating with the spirit world through the utilization of runes, spells, sigils, tarot, and other methods for the purposes of divination, helping to manifest positive life changes and the accomplishment of personal goals. In Chaos Protocols, Gordon describes the very practical uses of magic to provide health and abundance even, perhaps especially, during times of economic duress and historic upheaval. It is this message of magic as a utilitarian tool that makes this topic so prescient for these times of technocratic takeover. Such spiritual forces just might impart the power to deter the transhumanist agenda that seeks to banish the spirit world forever in favor of a future where humans are no longer connected to an organic consciousness, but instead live out life enslaved inside a materialistic hive mind constructed more out of machine than flesh and blood. For those of you like me who have trouble accepting the possibility of a reality behind the veil, Gordon's many years of experience and his ability to describe how magic works from a variety of perspectives, both practical and historical, will make a believer out of anyone open-minded enough to pay attention. His podcast, Rune Soup, provides excellent conversation with guests from all over the world, describing magical and mystical lineages, both modern and ancient. For those with ears to hear, the information contained therein provides an immense wealth of knowledge, illustrating not only the diversity of approaches to magic unique to each community and culture, but also highlighting an almost objective similarity that ultimately reveals a worldview which includes a multi-dimensional living universe where the process of the creation of reality is an ongoing cooperative effort between the spirits and those willing to enter into communion. Though this is difficult to believe for the many colonized minds of the modern day, such a concept of reality creation through just such interaction with the spirit world has been the bedrock of the human metaphysical construct for tens of thousands of years, only to be usurped by the forces of empire imposing a materialistic phenomenology upon the minds of those assimilated into the lower classes of the patriarchal hierarchy. Gordon asks all of us to become invincible by blasting through our cognitive dissonance and remembering all those times something happened in our lives that remains inexplicable through the modern scientific mythos. Such experiences open a rift in the fabric of reality that allows the spirits in to do their thing. Find out more about the work of Gordon White at www.runesoup.com. As always, if you like what you're hearing, please like, subscribe, and share this podcast throughout your social media network. We rely on listeners like you to distribute this information far and wide. Go to www.theshiftnow.com to find out more about the show, discover hundreds of hours of free content, subscribe for feature-length episodes of the podcast, and sign up for the weekly newsletter to keep up with all the latest news and information coming out of our studio. I want to give a big welcome to Gordon White for agreeing to come on the program, and a big thanks to you for helping to make the shift. And hello, everyone. Welcome to this, the 76th episode of The Shift. I'm your host, Doug McKinty. I'm joined today by Gordon White. He is the host of the podcast and the author of the blog, Rune Soup. Uh, I've had him on the show because I'm really curious about his perspectives about modern magic and how it works in the world. Um, Just to preface this conversation, I kind of come at... uh, all of all of this uh, this shift that I talk about on the program, kicking and stream, screaming because I come from a very Western philosophical background, and so uh, you know I finally kind of got into conspiracy theory, alternative ways of thinking, um, and I've done uh, things like Tai Chi and a little bit of Native American ceremony to start to understand how the other half thinks, if you will. Um, But the idea of delving into magic uh, is something that is kind of mind-blowing to me. So I'm happy to have Gordon on the show uh, so he can kind of uh, put my feet on the ground or or get my feet wet, maybe, is the best way to put it in terms of uh, how does magic work? How can we use it? Where does it come from? Uh, Is it real? Yeah, things like that. Because, (laughs) again, I you know, just coming from this uh, very skeptical perspective, place, although I'm totally open-minded, so I'm looking forward to this. 
Uh, I think I can't help myself, Gordon, but I have to do it uh, for the opening question I need to ask. Were you a weird kid? Sure. Um, I I was kind of annoyingly precocious, I guess. Like, uh, apparently I hit a lot of verbal milestones early and, and so on, which made me... Um, yeah, which made me odd, uh, at least amongst my like cousins and 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 so on. <clears throat> mm. But in terms of the kind of stuff I talk about on the show, it's interesting. I retroactively realized I had some sort of experience of stuff that went on in in my childhood, because it, my my journey with magic began at, at age thirteen, where I just kind of woke up after a fairly. I don't remember the dream, but I remember it was intense. And I woke up. And I was refereeing soccer at the time because I always like to make money, but I didn't have enough. So I also stole some money from my mother's purse and walked down the hill about Uh-oh. four or five miles to um, things that used to exist, like a good independent bookstore. And so I bought a bunch of books on like wicker and druidry, all the things that turned out to be quite terrible um, book-wise, yeah. <laughs> not discipline-wise. The books were terrible. And a pack of cigarettes because I was underage. And I went and sat in a uh, grandstand where I used to play rugby. And that was it for me in magic. But going through magic and then discovering ufology and so on in early adulthood made me realize, hang on a minute. When I was younger, I had uh, sleep paralysis experiences that are commonly referred to as hag attacks, um, things that look like screen memories of other encounters, like being a very small child and having dreams of being immobilized by the weave of the sheets. Like I'd be very small and the, the weave of the fitted sheet would become like ship rope. Mm-hmm. And I'd be immobilized in place. And I have memories of like giant um, needles and beings with bee heads and all very like Whitley Strieber communion type stuff that I thought was and may well have been just nightmares, whatever they are. Um, but it was afterwards as I got further and further into this this collection of disciplines that made me realize maybe I was a weird kid. Like maybe I had things happen to me, given how my life turned out, probably. Maybe right. I had things happen to me that I always ask my guests about. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. And, and if you haven't heard Rune Soup, uh, Gordon always asks his his first time guests this question. Um, but I do. And, and I actually when I first started listening to your podcast, um, I thought it was a great intro, because I think a lot of us that have alternative perspectives as we get older, we did have strange childhoods for one reason yeah. or another, kind of throws us out of the typical cultural milieu, I guess. Uh, and and also, it. like, I've been doing it for a while now, right? So it was certainly in the land of magic, um, a very early podcast. And so I wanted to accomplish a couple of things. I grew up in regional Australia, so I wanted to kind of turn some of my heroes or authors into real people. Um, mm-hmm. I did a film degree and documentary and so on. So I was very bullish about the power of what was then audio and now is, I guess, AV as a medium to do that. But also people were unfamiliar with podcasts. So I get academics as well as magicians and and, and anthropologists and indigenous activists and so on. And some of them, very often at least, it was the first time on the podcast and people would be on any podcast and they'd be quite nervous. And it's sort of a bit of a Jedi mind trick. People have got their notes ready in front of them in case I'm going to ask them hard questions or so on. But right. everyone knows their childhood, good or bad. And it's a, it's a way of benignly destabilizing your guest so that they feel welcome and yeah. they feel like, oh, actually, I can do this. I can. It's just a chat, right? Right, right, for sure. Well, at what, were your parents into this kind of thing? Were they into magic or into alternative belief systems? Or what do you think kind of caused you to have interest at such a young age? I do think it was extra dimensional. There is uh, weird family lineage stuff, uh, some of it in the spirit world, some of it physically. So my mother is a uh, quite good and still practicing energy healer on um, the East Coast of Australia here. Okay. Uh, and she, like, before I was born, um, when she was still single and, and was she was an English teacher in regional Australia and lived in a haunted house and did really 70s things like automatic writing and 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 so on. But she's kind of rediscovered it. It was almost like I gave permission or changed the field in the house when I started doing this as a kid for her to rediscover it. And and it's not it's not quite correct. That is the sequence in which it happened, but also her kids started to grow up so she could she had time to do things other than be a mother. And and so she's been she's met the Dalai Lama a bunch of times and you know all, all this kind of stuff. So okay. there is there's like a subsequent lineage and and along the maternal um 
the maternal maternal line is the we had sort of cunning women in Roscommon in Ireland uh, before my family came out to Australia in the Second Fleet, and and so we there's like sort of a lineage, but not like most people if they actually know their history can go far enough back and find someone who's a bit dodgy, right? Right. Certainly for Australia. <laughs> um, and on my on my father's side, my my father's father was involved in colonial administration in New Guinea. So he kind of ran parts of New Guinea. He's technically he's in the crown if you've watched it. So when when like the young um Philip and Elizabeth show up in in New Guinea, they meet my grandfather, right? So um there is some strange spirit stuff that I found subsequently doing different journeying and ancestor work and whatever over the years. Uh, my grandfather did some unusual things, unusual for the time in New Guinea. For instance, when they were naming stuff, he's like, well, what do the locals call it? Like trying to name this new bay or this new hill or the river. And he's like, well, it probably already has a name. Um, so <laughs> what do right. the locals call it? Which is wild for, you know, British colonialism, because generally it's like, we'll name that one Wellington, we'll name that one Waterloo, we'll name <laughs> yeah. that, you know. Um, that was the first thing. And also during a, uh, a very severe cyclone, he ended up saving about 200 lives. So there's um, streets still in Port Moresby that are named after him. And apparently these acts attracted the attention of some sort of Pacific lineage spirits that are now kind of part of that father's father's lineage. So there's like, there's a family tradition in the physical on one side, and there's almost like a non-physical in the other. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. So there was some stuff going on in your family that that made you open-minded to the possibilities, I guess. No, like, literally, it was absolutely not the case when I woke up. Like, I didn't grow up in a house where that happened. In fact, the opposite. My parent, my mother grew up Catholic, and as most people did in, okay. um, in regional Australia, and left it as a very early adult. Like, as soon as she could make her own money working part-time, 14 or 15, she just stopped going. And my grandparents were practicing Catholics their whole lives. Mm -hmm. And what, they would come and visit us after mass on a Sunday. And so I would have been about six. And my grandmother came in the door one day and I said, where, you know, where are you now? And she's like, oh, I've just been to church, darling. And I apparently thought about this for a little bit and said, oh, did you get married? Mm -hmm. And she gave my dad one of her famous withering stares. So like <laughs> I grew up with nothing. <laughs> I grew up with nothing. And then I had that strange experience at 13 that allowed me to, to discover magic, which gave me the framework to subsequently situate other stuff that had happened in my childhood. So in many respects, that's the origin of the question, because it's not just, were you a weird kid? It's also like, how do you frame what happened to you that, and like, that's, that's open to anyone. Like, how do you frame what happened to you to, to get to where you are? But it, it, I definitely didn't grow up around it in any sense of the term uh, that as, as I was growing up that I was aware of. Once I hit my teenage years, yes, and really hilarious. There's a terrible book in that somewhere of, you know, nascent early love spells and other things that you do as you're kind of going through adolescence. But yes, didn't grow up in Hogwarts, put it that way. Yeah, yeah. Well, but you were, I mean, I guess, well, I guess we, we can just go into from this angle. I'm trying to create a bigger picture. Like my curiosity is about what is the, like the metaphysical structure of magic or what, I mean, I've done a lot of, you know, comparative philosophy, comparative religion, and I've done Tai Chi. It took me a while to kind of like go, wow, you know, this Chi stuff is real. Like my mm. Western mind didn't want to believe in that. Um, and then, you know, trying to come at this as objective as I can <laughs> and then realizing, well, there is this, you know, aspect of reality that's entirely subjective and, and then getting to a place where like, well, I can feel, you know, this energy that's working in these channels and how it works in the system. And then gradually being able to believe that, you know, the traditional Chinese system or the Hindu system or these other, these other systems that describe the internal energy, you know, like, wow, well, I can see where you know, yeah. they came up with this and they felt these and this is their their version of science. Uh, and it's uh, objectively validated to some extent because so many people have similar experiences when they learn how to feel this system. Um, but then magic takes it to this whole other level and that level of the spirit world or or multidimensional reality, I guess, you know, that there are entities in uh, other dimensions that we can latch on to. And that one is a, is a difficult one for me. I mean, it's commonplace in most cultures and 
uh, certainly in the Native American cultures that I've experienced. Um, but still, again, my my colonized mind, right, is going to question. That's a kind of a leap of faith that's challenging for me. How, how do you describe that to other people, or what was your experience, or were you just completely open minded to it as you started? Playing? No, no, no. I um, so you kind of have to use empiricism to empirically demonstrate that empiricism is insufficient for describing reality. Right. right. So, <laughs> yeah. and I, I, that's the journey of the first decade of the blog is that it's, and that's why I got into ufology and, and, you know, parapsychology and all the rest of it, because I needed that to, to get to, and what it does, you get good at it and you, you realize both the power, um, the power of empiricism is in its limitations, right? So, what we're doing at the moment is empirical abuse in the sense that we're making this remarkable mode of being in the world. We're forcing it to do something that it is, was never meant to do, which is like describe all of reality and, and, and objectively say that things are and aren't real and whatever. It just gets bound up in power. Like, so mm-hmm. you have to go on right. a journey with empiricism to, to free it. Like it, it is, I think an exploration of magic is the redemption of science rather than the rejection of it, right? Okay. Uh, because I like science. Um, I, I, I'm interested right. in any kind of song in response to reality, which is literally all I think it is, um, just as anything else is. But as for, and consequently, you said, it was good that you said colonize mind there, because there's a bunch of stuff that you just breeze past that we assume is true or take as true so that we can have discussions. And one of the things I like is to be like, nope, pulling you back, pulling you back. Um, yeah, yeah. Objective, subjective. <laughs> um leap of faith and even believe like believe is a word that comes from a european mode of being so i I, like if you say um the caro believe the andes are apus um so the caro are a um andean culture Mm -hmm. and apus is uh the name for like mountain spirits that's wrong they don't believe the mountains are Apus. They experience the mountains as Apus. When we say believe, it's, it has a, a subtle betrayal in it, which is that we, because we say, oh, the Kero believe the mountains are Apus, but we really know that they're mountains. So that's the trouble. That's when you have that colonized scientific mind. And right. the language we use, even with the best will in the world, means that we can never... Um, never get to the to a healthy form of comparison that allows us to um, come to an awareness of magic because it's funny you mentioned like and i agree i agree completely like if you do tai chi or any kind of meridian system or you start to look at ayurveda and you go okay this is and i would say the opposite i would say science is our version of that rather than that's their version of science Mm -hmm. because again the, the language is important there but Meridian, the Ayurveda is a better example. So these kind of like traditional Indian health systems don't exist in a bubble, right? So I had a um, Vedic astrologer, a Vedic astrologer on the show recently, and he's like, "There's sort of no such thing as Vedic astrology, because it's the wisdom of being in a world that is alive and relational. So you can't have Ayurveda without Vedic astrology. You can't have it without plant spirits. You can't have it without anything else. So you're, the way you made a slice there is in some respects erroneous because you're like, okay, I, I accept that this sort of form of energy medicine is not just real, but, and this is also true, like it's not like it's a wrong statement, that we can empirically demonstrate that energy medicine has an, a material effect, right? And that's true. Like mm-hmm. I, I have guests on the show about that all the time. As I said, my mother's an energy healer. healer. This is not up for debate. Like the, the science, the data are in on that, right? Uh, but it's almost like saying, can you have a shark without the ocean? Because you said, I believe sharks are real, but I'm not sure if the ocean is. Because the ocean in this case is the spirits. The ocean in this case is the spirit world in a living universe. The shark is the energy medicine system. And particularly when it comes to Ayurveda or whatever, it's like, oh, sharks are real, so but the ocean isn't. And you go, that's not... It's not how uh, a, a traditional Indian experience of that would go. You can't have the energy medicine system. You can't have it as a relational thing unless you're in a living and aware relational universe because it's not just energy medicine. We know that with uh, Chinese medicine systems as well. It's contained within 
an idea of plant medicine, which is not molecular in um, its efficacy. It is, it is holistic in its efficacy. It is the plant. It is not a molecule within it that, because human, Westerners think the only way to get to truth is to turn everything into the smallest parts, right? right. Which is dumb. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> And so the whole language, and this is the thing, because it's funny, you probably ask, what do you think magic is? Magic is a word that had to come, obviously the word itself derives from like the Near East, but we understand it having come through its European context for the last, say, two and a half thousand years, right? It's a word that probably shouldn't exist because magic doesn't exist because when we say that, it is a European perceptual error on a living universe. So if you go anywhere else in the world, if you go to Sub-Saharan Africa, if you go to the Amazon, if you go to the Australian deserts, you have normal people, like they're not shamans, they're not anything, just like people living their lives, who are in contact with spirits and, and are so good at operating in and out of dreaming space that uh, what happens in dream has an implication in their life and vice versa. And there's, there are um, linguistic and ritual techniques to, to make that, that being coherent in the, in the imaginal and in the waking world in relation to their ancestors and other living beings and totems and so on. Each one of those things, if we pull them apart, we can say, oh, so magic is um, finding, like connecting with your ancestors and magic is learning how to um, dream in an aware way. So we've kind of, we've taken what is, I think, normal in reality and almost pathologized it because we, we, we have this kind of, dualist split in our mind so magic is simultaneously everything and and an error and a description error uh, and and kind of you have to go through it to realize inside what we understand european magic to be are a whole bunch of praxis that look something like the stuff we find elsewhere in in the world because remember um it's only in the last everyone everywhere Every when up until Northwest Europe, 300 years ago, give or take, three to 500 years ago, experienced the world like this. Right. So it's, it's, it's the inverse is a case in the sense of like, oh, well, maybe this is real, maybe it isn't. So now hang on, we're talking about 5% of the population thinks it isn't, and 95% is. Right. So actually, the claim, like, who's making the extraordinary claim in that situation? Like, do you honestly, not you personally, this is a hypothetical you or a, sure. a, the royal you, do you honestly <laughs> believe that some waistcoated white people three centuries ago got it right and everyone else, everyone, even yeah. up today, got it wrong? That's a bold claim. And when you describe it that way, you get to do, it's the 21st century, it's 2021, you get to call that person racist. <laughs> It's pretty wild. And there's um, a lot of racism going on by people that don't even, I mean, you know, yeah, I don't yeah, know. It's yeah. so funny that are projecting that way, their racism on everybody else. Yeah. It's like, hey, man, <laughs> I mean, you think this world is this materialist, you know, you're laughing at every other culture in the history exactly. of the world and exactly. you're calling me a racist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? um, so I, I, I don't actually do that because I just like to say it as a cheeky thing because it is technically true. You will get to people who go, wow. Yeah, you, you can. If it's a good natured conversation, you can go, and that's why you're a racist, um, right? <laughs> be, because that does. People do generally sit with that. If it's if you're kind of like chatting in a dinner party situation, and you you kind of go on the rant that I just did, which is that you have made a bold assumption that less than five percent of the world's population is correct, and it is a kind of correct where everyone else is completely wrong, and has always been completely wrong. And those people are all white and they invented these empires that completely destroyed the world. Right. And you say it like that, people will be like, oh. Yeah. Hmm. And it's good. Like, you know, <laughs> it doesn't need to be an argument. It needs to be, because we've all been so colonized that you go, wow, that's actually, oh my God. Yeah. Generally, the people who are open there to the discussion are like you, Doug. They're like, but I go to yoga. Um, I, I have a naturopath. Like, I know that. I experience the world as alive, but I judge the world as not. So that's a personal journey that I need to go through. And that's good. And I think more people, especially in the last, let's just say, 13 months, have um, have embarked on that journey. I think a lot of people have been, whether they want it or not, um, confronted with what they think um, the universe really is. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, exactly what you're talking about in terms of, of this cultural development and that so many other cultures have had this these concepts about living in a, in a living universe. That's what's allowed me. I mean, I just had to persevere. Somehow, probably in my early 20s, late teens, I developed a respect for the concept of culture, like knowledge evolves. Millions of people over generations have, you know, figured out these systems. There must be something to them. They can't just be, you know, wrong. Yeah. I mean, what are they, you know, the, the colonized mind tells you it's, oh, that was just their superstition. Like, yep. You mean they just were? They just made stuff up for for thousands of years because it was completely dysfunctional, non-functional, totally f uh, figments of their imagination. You know, I don't. Yeah. That, that statement makes so little sense that I have battled my own, you know, cognitive dissonance to go like, okay, what are you know, what are these ideas about? What is what do these cultures believe that is missing from the the modern culture, from the colonized culture that I was raised in? There's got to be something to this, and, I, and I'm slowly again kicking, yeah. screaming, so, you know, getting to a point um, where I'm like, wow. Bruno, and I come at, I know exactly what you mean. And the other way to come at it, Bruno Latour famously said that we have never been modern. And what he means by that, like, so the 19th century, you invent things like uh, anthropology and they go out. Anthropology began as a discipline explaining why brown people are more stupid than white people, right? right. Like they couldn't tell the difference between their dreams and awake and, and so on. And, and the white person, um, the European anthropologist, who, by the way, didn't do any field work. That was not gentlemanly. Like these, these are all hot takes in, in like libraries in Amsterdam and London and so on. Uh, they had these ideas of progress that are savage, it, like this is Bruno Latour's point. It's like yeah. you, um, what we were just saying, the, the premises upon which European civilization for the last three centuries has operated are stupid. They are as stupid as some people think talking to a rock is. And it's that belief in progress, it's that uh, belief that literally nothing exists it, that cannot be measured by sense data, which is a, sa a statement that you can't support with sense data because you don't have sense data for the whole universe. So never mind that. But like, if you actually right. look at the, the the premises or the the claims of the Enlightenment, they are as stupid. I think more stupid. But like Bruno's point is that um, you are as savage as the people who you think of as savage because your ideas have absolutely no basis in reality either like right. and that's another way in it's not even like which you, everything you said is correct it's like you mean to tell me that the oldest continually practicing cultures on earth which are in aboriginal australia who have seen off ice ages have sailed through actual ice ages have learned nothing yeah. <laughs> in right. 60,000 years. Yeah. They've been wrong for 60,000 years. <laughs> it's bold, right? Um, but right. the other way in is to realize we are, if you don't think that, if you think, no, they're dumb, a tree is a tree and a rock is a rock. Well, I've got news for you. You're dumb too. Like that's Bruno's way in, which is like, you're not, there's no such thing as modern. Modern is as savage a belief system as you'll find anywhere. Like it's based on the same, like, this is how, this is what I think reality is. Like it, it and if anything, it's stupider. Well, it is stupider, but one of the ways it's stupider is that it doesn't know that. What you what you find in animus cultures, so um, Australia prior to contact or the Amazon, where you have all these different cosmologies um, associated with different tribal groups that are interacting with each other, they have a way of living in their framework and learning from another framework without a right-wrong um, tension right? Mm -hmm. So they have a cosmology that allows their cosmology to be true and all other cosmologies to be true. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And we don't, that's like ours is shit, but ours can't even do that. <laughs> it thinks it's not a cosmology and it can't interact with other cosmologies without breaking them. Yeah. Uh, so we've never been modern. <laughs> it's my <Yeah>. point. <laughs> oh, that, you know, actually that is a, is a, is a, is a really powerful point. I was doing um, sweat lodge ceremony here and you know probably took me like a year i mean i look back and like i was such an ignorant white person and arrogant arrogant is a is a great <laughs> word to describe exactly this what happens when you're a believer in that concept of progress and when you think that your cosmology is is the only one and you've got to be comparing it and and when i realized that the people that i was meeting and getting to know they literally they, they could care less what somebody else did like these are my ways and this is what yeah. I do. And, and yeah. there was no judgment or, you, you know, uh, feeling like you've got to compare these two and figure out which one is yeah. better, you know, so like someone else's reality doesn't make a claim on your own experience of reality. And that's right. the, the tension that people who come out of 
like a, a an enlightenment materialist world that um because it one of its stupid ideas like universal claims about the cosmos it can't sit with the idea that someone else experiences reality differently but that's literally the basis of how i mean the term is problematic but i've written a whole book about it that's coming out later this year but mm -hmm. That's literally the basis of how animist cultures would work. Like they live in a universe where the whole point is it's effectively between you and the universe. Like your experience of reality is wholly valid. Someone else's is wholly valid. And it's one of the things that we can't do. It's an irritant. And it flows into politics, right? Like we were joking about everyone calling each other racism, racist. Like the, the sort of late capitalist identitarian defense of the system that we have at the moment can't exist in, in a world where other people think differently. Why, like it, it, the, the claims of a, of a materialist panicked reality can't handle operating on a planet where people think differently to them. It's, it's interesting. It's like they're, they're so insecure in their own um, experience of reality that it can't. And, and so we have this sort of um, spewing forth of, of, of totalizations yeah. Because it it can't be one or the other. Like it's like no, you you have to think this because if you don't, like it, it might not be real. That appears to be right. if people aren't examining it. If you if you're looking at the kind of unfolding of of like official narratives and and like official positions around the West, they are they are totalizing. They they can't they can't be like well I think here's the best way I think to to deal with structural racism and we're going to go down that path. It's like no. <laughs> Everyone, <laughs> everyone must do this, or everyone must. Um, yeah, everyone must do environmentalism this way. So it's like everyone must do climate alarmism rather than um, local replanting or something. It's like no, it, it's either it is binary. It's all or nothing, and that's it's kind of it's a thing I've struggled to get people to see um, over the last year and a bit. But it's literally the same thinking. So Charles Eisenstein calls that the story of separation, right? It's this that kind of interventionist idea, this, this panicked totalizing response. And it's that idea in general. And that comes through everywhere. It's not making a, it's not making a hierarchical or stacked claim about where people fall when it comes to, I don't know, masks or something, right? It's actually right. that idea that everyone must agree with me. Um, by any means, under any and all circumstances, that thinking yeah. is alien to the rest of the world, historically speaking. Right. And, and then if you disagree with someone, it's like a personal attack. Or if you want to make a different personal <laughs> choice, like I, I've been dealing with this. I mean, of course, we're all dealing with this, I think, now with the vaccine issue. I mean, people yeah. who are getting the vaccines, it's like they can't comprehend that somebody else would just choose not to. And yeah. you're, you're But like they literally can't comprehend it because... Yeah, <laughs> it's it's a total belief. It's it's binary, um, and and the, and they can't comprehend it because they jump down to the next level of discussion. It's like, oh, what you don't you don't think uh, the virus exists, or it's or it's serious, or you don't think vaccines work. And I'm like, no, it's none of that. It's it's back up here, which is like, no, I don't want to take it. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Right? It's just, I don't want to take it. Right? Like, <laughs> they, they, it's this. They've already blown past that assumption because they never were not going to take it so they think the the tension is downstream mm -hmm. but it's actually upstream it's like no take it i don't care yeah go and you know go for it uh yeah, and, yeah, and right. that, that totalizing dis discussion is uh not going away anytime soon and i think it's going to wreck a lot of continue to wreck a lot of stuff i i don't see how i don't see how we come out of this nosedive except to leave that thinking entirely in like not Leave leave forming angry positions around masks or vaccines one way or the other entirely, <laughs> and and move into like what Charles would call the story of interbeing. Right, like we need to we need to realize we need to operate at the level of frameworks rather than down inside belief systems where we're arguing over facts. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's so amazing. And and I, I mean, I've even been going so far as to produce a lot of podcasts about the psychology. I call it, I'm doing a psychology of lockdown series. Like, why is it when you talk to someone and you have a disagreement, it's like, I'm realizing that people are, they feel like it's a personal attack, then yeah. they're getting triggered. And then you're having like, 
you know, a, not just an argument, but a totally irrational argument because they're just, you know, they're, sc- you know, scrambling for whatever argument that they've got to beat you. They've got to beat you down because if they're wrong, it like, it, it crushes their very being, you know, yeah. uh, like you're talking about. Whereas I can come at it from the point of view where people can have different points of view and the world still goes on. It's just fine. Yeah. Like, it's not that, you know, <laughs> it's not the end of the world because there's not one truth. Like there is as many truths as there are people who are having an experience. Maybe you could talk about this for a little while. Cause I, I mean, I spent years thinking about like, uh, you know, what is as as someone who studied Western philosophy in school, you know, to me, learning was reading books and, and, and arguing facts. I mean, that's the way I was taught about it. And, but I was fascinated by these other belief systems and, and this concept of, what is called the spirit path or, you know, walking your own path. I think this is the opposite epistemology of, I mean, this kind of describes what you're talking about, but I mean, in traditional Chinese, you know, they've just kind of almost objectified it a bit into the idea of the Tao or the way. And then to, in my experience, I guess, in indigenous cultures, it's almost even more subjective than that, where each individual has their own experience. I almost see like Tai Chi as a kind of a good introduction into a lot of these concepts for me because it was almost so structured that I could, my mind could make that leap. And now I'm trying to get to this place where I can, you know, go even farther down that rabbit hole and start to incorporate ideas like magic or multidimensional realities or, you know, and this, this way more subjective way of viewing things. But do you want to do you want sure. to comment on on your thoughts there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, Taoism is actually a good way. Well, Taoism is indigenous anyway. Like we, the documents we have for it are a kind of bundling up of, I would like Chinese cosmologies that are twenty thousand years old, right? Like yeah. not even yeah. we we can talk about oh this document's five hundred BC, sure. Um, but it's describing we, we have the archaeology for it. If you look at how the hills have been. Um, Hills that have been terraformed in in ancient China are an indication that something like Taoism has been in play for tens of millennia, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but you, you mentioned like the what we need is a new language of individuality and difference that asserts their like fundamental cosmic reality. And the way is sort of correct in that sense because the way that can be named is not the way. So it's not that we have this idea that. Um, if everyone has their own truth, then there is no truth. That's not correct, right? And 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 Taoism gets that. The way that can be named is not the way. So there is a way. You just can't name it. That's right. one of its features, right? Right. <laughs> so it, it um, that is a that is a better mode of of being with um, something that is universally true. And the universal truth is. Uh, truth exists at the experiential level of each person, like in the cosmos. So when you're talking about arguing over facts, like that's a Socratic method and and it's cool. Like there's actually, um, if you view it as a ritual, if you view it as ceremony, so mm-hmm. the the method, we there are more methods of making things true or validating truth than the Socratic one that you described, which is uh, essentially debate, right? Um, that's That's at the heart of, uh, 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 the one way that Europe made things true for 2,500 years, um, because it's at the heart of how we do science as well as like how we do philosophy and so on. Um, but there are so many, there's there's dream and singing and, and all this kind of other ways of making things true, but we don't have a language for how we make those things true. Cause the only way we know how to make things true is, is arguing um, facts or, uh, which is a very disembodied process. Like this is mm-hmm. the trouble with the Socratics is it's all in the head um, and, and nothing's in the head, right? So wh- how I do it, right? Well, how I did it historically is we sort of forget and we forget because we're not taught it and we're not taught it because it's uh, irritating to Western civilization, but we do have schools of philosophy that are closer to um, Taoism and indigenous thought and so on. And of course, phenomenology is, is the main one, right? So that you actually literally assert that reality exists in the experience. We have this disembodied idea that we got from the Greeks and we made it worse with like Descartes and Kant and so on, mm-hmm. that actually sensory experience is erroneous 
And it, it and philosophy's job is to sort out whether inside your, the, this monkey skull is to sort out whether what you're experiencing is real or not, or if you even can experience it. So we have this um, dissociation. We have a dissociative disorder that we think of as reality. And those were the people who went around the world experiencing other cultures via colonial contact, right? right. Whereas everywhere else, and, and we do have it in, in European philosophy. We do have, actually that's a dumb premise. That is a dumb way of thinking that your experience of reality is fake or erroneous, and it falls to your intellectual process one way or the other to decide what's true and what isn't, or if you can learn anything is true in the first place. Why not? Because I certainly experience reality is real. I certainly experience truth is real. So why is that? Why do we not shift the? Why do we not shift the universe to that moment of contact with it? And when we and that's phenomenology, right? That's an oversimplification, but we'll go with it. Um, why do we not shift reality to the experience of it, which includes? how we think about it. Because thinking isn't something you do in a disembodied, you don't have an experience and then go away and think about it. Wherever you're thinking, you're still experiencing. So you might have, you might be, go for a walk through the woods and try something out. Like I'm gonna try and talk to that tree. And you talk to the tree and go, that's weird. Like I, I have a sense of what it is. And then you can come back home and look up the thing that the tree told you about it. You can look it up. And go, okay, so the experience I had talking to the tree has some match to things we know about it scientifically. And it, but that's not a secondary process, right? When you are sitting in front of your computer doing that research, you are still experiencing. You're then experiencing where you and your computer and your body and your keyboard and everything is. Mm -hmm. So there is no disembodied encounter with thoughts, right? And that once you realize that, and, and phenomenology can get you there, but other things can. I did it through anthropology, I did it through perspectivism and so on. But what, what you have to get at is the underlying assumptions of how we make things true are themselves, it's not that they're wrong, but they're both available for critique and they are um, not the only way to do it. And we think they are because we haven't been told otherwise. Yeah. Like we haven't been told that in fact there are other ways of making things true than a bunch of Greek pedophiles sitting around arguing thoughts, like arguing takes, which right. is the Socratic method. Um, but it is. <laughs> <laughs> right, you know? um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that kind of popped into my mind that, that started me shifting away from just this idea of, of the objective universe, I actually got this from uh, the book, The Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, but which is, um, you, you know, in my mind, part of that lineage of, of American pragmatism. Totally. But great uh, book. And he talks about uh, he talks about how, well, there's an infinite number of variables in the universe. Like, how can arguing logically actually function as a path towards the truth when yep. there's there's just simply too many variables? You're never going to experience all of them. You can't argue your way to the truth when any, uh, you know, a new variable is going to pop up or, you know, is popping up left and right all the time. You're yep. only, you're reducing the world into a, you know, a, 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 an if, you know, then statement. And then you're, you're having this argument between these two variables, which is the, the sort of like the best you can do. I mean, that's even in the scientific method. That's kind of what they do is they try to box it into these two variables and figure out, you know, which one, which is going to be the correct answer. Um, but in reality, there's an infinity of variables. Okay. And, and so all you're actually doing is just still like participating in this. I mean, this you're still, you're saying, this, you're this still inside universe. the framework. You're still inside the framework where the truth, the only way you find truth is to go down and atomize and there are individual fixed components of it. And that, I mean, coming back to the last 13 months, you see that in play. Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance is, motorcycle maintenance is a good example, but you see that in play where the human virome has trillions of viruses in it. Right. So what are we going to do? Like, we're, and we're talking again. We're talking about variants. Like, so would you want a jab for each of those trillion? Like, is there yeah. Yeah. Um, in, in indigenous contexts and animist contexts, which is subtly different? Um, there is a better language for navigating complexity. I don't want to say managing it, but it's because reality doesn't, it is not um, proven and will never be proven that truth is only found by 
um, atomizing down, like dropping down into that. Like it's the Rupert Sheldrake talks about like, it, it's as if the only way to understand how software works is to put your laptop in a blender. Like that's science. Mm-hmm. Like it's not, it, it's, that's the one way it makes truth. But um, Motorcycle Maintenance, great book in that sense, because it, it is actually all about um, being led by perception, not all about, but um, it is asserting very phenomenologically the validity, like the cosmic validity of perception and, and the fact that like, you can be led through the cosmos by perceiving beauty. And actually the Greeks have that too, right? Like it's just, we've, we've sort of done it differently, but we do have available to us. And that's a good example. Frameworks that allow a cleaner opportunity for learning from um, other systems. I don't even like the word culture, but like other cosmovisions uh, mm-hmm. around the world. Uh, because if we if we try to learn from the Avila Runa in, in the Amazon, if we try to learn from them and we think there's no such thing as objective truth and, and you know, these sort of atomized ways of, of learning, we won't actually, we might as well be talking to a hamburger, like, because we don't, we don't have the framework that allows those frameworks to um, learn from each other without breaking this one because we're going in fundamentally with the idea that they are somehow in error or that they're th- what they think of as true is exclusive to them. But what we think of is true, which is that there is no objective truth, is objectively true. And it's, it's right. <laughs> thorny, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But we do have available to us. So it's we, we can, if you sort of situate yourself somewhere in between motorcycle maintenance and phenomenology, you, you, you come to your own awareness that your perception is, it's not just that it's valid, that's the fucking universe. And that's, that's where it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and once you're there, you, I'm not necessarily saying you will understand um, other cosmovisions at that point, but I can tell you that you won't be wrong or it won't be a failed project straight out of the gate. And this is coming back to magic. What I meant by is ma- is magic even real, or is it a term that we've used in the West because we have made some fundamental errors in our in our baseline assumptions? Sure. And so, when things like spirits occur to us, we have to kind of box it into this idea of magic as separate and and diametrically opposed to yeah. religion and and science it's, because that's not the case anywhere else do you know what i mean like yeah um, every whilst we, you will get shamans and witch doctors and sorcerers and witches and, and all that kind of stuff that they're, they're true um the example i use for this is like everyone has teeth but not everyone is a dentist and and so Ordinary humans, including my own grandmother, probably yours or great grandmother, all of these people going back through European history, experienced a living universe, experienced spirits, and and so on. So the term magic, I say, as a professional magician, is um, in many respects erroneous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I heard, uh, I, I did hear that interview with the with the uh, the Ayurvedic astrologer, and I think he mentioned that you know people in India, Freedom, yeah. they. Uh, when they hear the word magic, they think of some guy pulling a rabbit out of a hat. Like it's not, it has nothing to do with what they're doing when they're participating in their cultural mythology or their cultural science, you know, their perspective on how to make choices about their everyday life using the knowledge that they have, you know, it's not. And and the other side of it is if we translate it as sorcery, then it's automatically bad. This is one of my uh, many critiques of how white people do witchcraft. Um, is it's there's this sort of feminist read that um and it's not that again it's not that it's wrong it's just that it's it's a minority story and it's not the only story on the planet there's a feminist read that um the witch trials are and this is you this is a valid historical um, position to take an assault on women's bodies and so on but in a contemporary context Mm -hmm. to assert one's to, to grow from that into a contemporary context that says um to be a witch is to be empowering for women um, is true for middle-class white women. Um, when we translate magic as witchcraft or sorcery elsewhere in the world, it is explicitly malefic magic. And it's not even done entirely by humans. So you can have demons that are witches or evil spirits that are sorcerers and so on. And that is the other challenge. And it's also that that's not even what we do, right? So if you go and talk to an ayahuasca 
the thing about being involved in ayahuasca is that you get, uh, because there's so much power involved in those ceremonies, sorcerers try to take it. They try to take your power. They try to suck life energy and whatever from the people that you are performing ceremony for. Mm-hmm. It's endless and exhausting. And, and that's sorcery. And so there's that whole, like, we don't do that, that you get with genuine healers. And and in the West, because we we think magic very often is just like a, we can wear it like we can wear the rest of our identities. It's another way of kind of being racist. It's like that's not, it's not that uh, it's not that you can't be a witch as a feminist political statement as a white woman in the West. It's that you can't make that totalizing claim because you are a vanishing minority in in the global experience or global understanding of witchcraft. Uh, and so this is like magic is erroneous. Witchcraft we think of these terms as positive, and they. They can be, but not always, right? So right. it's funny. Um, you get far enough into it, and it's a couple of decades for me now, but you get far enough into it to, and uh, one of my singular goals has been to kind of put whatever Western magic is, um, put is the wrong word. It's to allow Western magic to see eye to eye with non-Western modalities. Because I've long assumed, I'm kind of making a case for it here. Um, I think the universe is alive and spirits are real, which means there is a baseline from which we can have those sort of framework to framework discussions. And it's it, the job internally in the West is to to sort of look at what other things that um, are in that framework that can be compared, and what are the things that are erroneous is unfair but like what are the things that are unique to us so the socratic method or thinking that witchcraft is universally good and all that That, those those you won't find anywhere else Mm -hmm. um and that doesn't invalidate them it means don't step forward with them (laughs) right step forward with where the other stuff is well and i think there's a lot of confusion about magic in western culture probably on on purpose i mean you know i read the book that i read of yours to prepare for this was the chaos protocols which is a very practical how to use magic in in this world in our given situation and um i I guess uh, one of the things that is has been striking me as i've been preparing for this conversation with you is that you know here here in the west we've been colonized oh i guess where i'm going with this is that as i read the book i it was describing a way to approach the world with your own personal empowerment i mean i think magic can can give that to you it's very individuating you're no longer part of you know, this patriarchal, hierarchical, colonized yeah. mind, but you're you're separate. You're an individual and you have your own position of power and you can use magic to manipulate your reality for your own benefit in this kind of chaotic world that we live in. Um, so it's a self-empowering and sure. anti-colonizing force, right? So when we start talking about like historically, like my interpretation of of the Inquisitions is really that's you know the the forces of patriarchy colonizing the the Europeans the the a real attempt to destroy that knowledge that European tradition magical tradition or mystical yep. tradition uh, and eliminate the knowledge and then so those of us that are curious about it now literally have to like piece the the puzzle pieces back together um, and that's what makes it so challenging because there's Correct. so many different traditions that we can pick and choose from. And how do you do it? Actually, one interesting thing, how do you do it without being culturally appropriative, you know, just sort of faking like I'm, I'm playing native or I'm, you know, playing Chinese or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, that one's my favorite because, uh, it's always fraught. And, and if you look at how we did it probably wrongly in the 20th century, so leaving aside the, <laughs> such a weird statement, leaving aside the intense racism of the imperial project, let's, yeah. <laughs> let's pick, uh, pick the story up with a different kind of, and more benign racism in the post-war period in the 60s and the rise of hippies and so on. Because in that, that, this is the era where you get, you can buy like dream catches in the gas station and, and right. uh, have that really orientalizing process, um, transcendental meditation and the Beatles and all this kind of decontextual takings. And, and there's a read, and it's a good one, that that is sort of like the, the final move in the imperial process, having taken all the physical things, is to come for the non-physical. And, right. and that's fair. That's a fair read of how, and it's funny, like if you know people, if you know old hippies who are kind of, recalling their 70s time they're like yes with the benefit of 50 years of hindsight what we were doing was 
culturally insensitive, but we were doing it for like it came from a heart place that was correct, which is that um, we genuinely wanted to learn. We just didn't know how to learn um, from these cultures. So it is always fraught. Mm. It doesn't mean not doing it because not doing it itself makes a truth claim that um, the Western worldview is the correct one and the rest of them are little baubles in a museum, right? Like you can't touch that. Um, that's a little bauble in a museum, but that's that's still racism. It's still the same racism. You're still putting Yoruba thought in, in a museum and leaving it just for Yoruba people. So you are asserting a fundamental difference between them and us um, on, a, on a race basis, not like a different experience because that's self-evident, um, but you are racially asserting a difference that means that you can you have nothing to learn from Yoruba or Aboriginal thought. This is what I mean by it's fraught. Uh, mm -hmm. You can't do it with a lack of awareness and you can't not do it with a lack of awareness. Um, I do happen to believe, and this is where I think magic is useful for Westerners, I do happen to believe that the only way out of, uh, the only way to Charles Eisenstein's story of interbeing or the only way to a better world our hearts know is possible, which is name of his book, right? Is, is learning how to learn from each other because um, I, I think that's urgent. And I yeah. think that's urgent everywhere because we have, we have misfirings of the heart at the moment. So people who, I mean, from an anarchist perspective, you can't be anti-state and pro-lockdown, um, but like the people who are deeply invested in the idea that um, lockdowns are efficacious, that is a misfiring of the heart. Um, they actually do believe they're helping people. Yeah. Um, uh, climate alarmism is the same thing. They actually do believe they're helping people by asserting more power is taken from uh, indigenous groups and given to transnational corporations to own rivers and so on. It's a misfire of the heart. All of these things, and it's because our framework is wrong and we're not going to get to a framework that allows the, um, the heart and the head to function correctly without learning how to learn. And, and that comes from encountering these other cosmovisions. That is my belief um mm. i can't point to anything else. not just belief that's what i'm doing <laughs> right. that's what i'm doing because i think it needs to be done and coming back to why magic is useful for that magic uh peter gray who is my publisher and, and author in and of his, his own right um co-founder of scarlet imprint sort of makes the point that magic has is nothing but and has always been cultural appropriation so there's a very famous collection of documents called the greek magical papyri um, from fourth century, third or fourth century um, Thebes, but describing the magic of Alexandria and kind of like Northern Egypt in that Hellenistic era. And this, these documents were clearly written by a um, priest and priests at the time would moonlight because you'd only have to be a priest for a certain chunk of the year uh, owing to the Egyptian calendar, right? Mm -hmm. The rest of the time, because you were initiated, you would do things like cast natal charts for money or perform spells and healing spells and all the rest of it. So these, these papyri is this guy's spell book. Um, and he's, a, he's Egyptian in the sense he, he probably wasn't Jewish, although um, a third of the Alexandrian population probably was at the time. But the book is filled with, or the, the, the papyri have Egyptian names, Greek god names, uh, multiple different names of Yahweh, Archangel Michael. It is, um, it's glorious. It is a mm. glory. And do you know why? It's because they worked. This comes back to that. Right. We, we assert reality at the efficacy of our experience. So he might have been a lineage priest of some temple or another in Thebes, but he works with these. He works with Jewish spirits. He works with Egyptian and Greek spirits and gods and and so on. Yeah. Because magic is is that um, is that immediacy of, of experience. So from from its very beginning, and even the term magic is in fact a reference to the magi, who were kind of like astro priests of of Persia. So the word magic itself, in in a European context, is initially the movement of that sort of astro wisdom from Persia, the appropriation of it from Persia uh, into Europe. So there's, um, when we say cultural appropriation, there's actually like, a, it's a weird way of saying it, there's a living and authentic way of doing it, which is magic. The reason this, this Theban sorcerer would, would do Jewish magic and, and, and call on Greek gods is because they worked. They have some level of reality to them. Yeah. So it's a, uh, 
it's it's thievery, but it's thievery between equals, and and that is a pretty good description of magic. And the same thing happens if you look at uh, at curanderismo anywhere in the Americas, but especially from like Mexico down, and even in like deeply uh, like deeply indigenous contexts like Cusco, uh, the majority of people outside of Lima are indigenous of one way or the other to um, to Peru, right? So you're dealing with indigenous people. And uh, uh, the curanderos there will do kind of stuff that's inspired by and incorporates um, Andean magic, but they'll do chakras, they'll do all this other stuff, stuff that they know works. It's been incorporated in them because right. just like the Theban sorcerer, if you're a curandero or a witch or whatever, in the good sense, um, over the course of your career, you have... Um, come into relation with different spirits and different systems that work for you and your clients. So um, how do we navigate cultural appropriation? Um, we have to. Magic is that, and, and, and not doing it is itself making a, a political statement. And it doesn't mean you can have whatever you want. It's the opposite of that. It doesn't mean, for the love of God, please don't wear a First Nations headdress to a music festival. Like, the, yeah. like cultural <laughs> appropriation is real, um, definitely. Right. Uh, but it's real in the sense of if you're going to do magic, you you can't avoid it, and you can't and 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 by avoiding it, you're still taking a position on it. So uh, fraught is is how we go with that. Yeah, that's for sure. I mean, it's interesting. I think you're right in discussing like coming from that heart place and having a good intention, and then you're probably going to make many mistakes. You're probably going to be rude without knowing it, and then having to learn, you know how oh you know and just being humble uh, when you realize. Uh, that there may have been an arrogance there that you didn't yeah. recognize. And, and a sincere arrogance. Like, so I don't know how much you know about the history of neo-shamanism, right? But like Michael Hanna, who is very old now, still alive, as far as I know, mm -hmm. um, who invented the term and knew like Carlos Castaneda and all that kind of stuff. But he was a, he's retired now, um, but he was actually an anthropologist and he kind of invented neo-shamanism. And, and that came from a hot place of, again, learning from and, and trying to convey different techniques like drumming for journeying and so on outside of the context in which they were found. And the, what looks different now from when he started in the early 70s is that you wouldn't, no one calls themselves a shaman now when they go through the process of neo-shamanism or whatever. So I have a bunch of friends who are maybe not coming through that discipline, but but similar ones, who will describe themselves as shamanic practitioners. Because to, to call yourself a shaman makes uh, a lot of claims uh, yeah. as to your role in a culture and, and the cultures you come from and, and all the rest of it. So, but again, Michael Hanna, when he said, okay, well, if you do, if you go through this school, then you're like, here's your certificate of being a shaman. Um, that came from a heart place. And now 40, 50 years later, we're like, there's right. a better way. There's a more <laughs> yeah, appropriate that, way right. now that we know right. things. And it doesn't make that, I mean, it is, it's wrong by today's standards, but it doesn't make it wrong. doesn't make the system wrong. It, it, um, and that's how we do it. That's how we, why it's fraught. Like maybe we'll call it something different yeah. as we come into awareness in relation with these ideas moving forward. But it's a really good example between the seventies where if you go through a Michael Hanna course, you'd be like, congratulations, you're a shaman. If you go through it now, you call yourself a shamanic practitioner. And that's different because you are practicing techniques that you have learned from a lineage. Like you've lineage learned some shamanic techniques, but you are not like a shaman and and that yeah that's an example of like it can be done um so if i can keep you for a few more minutes i just want to finish up with like this one other conversation because it's been it's been bubbling up i mean sometimes i wonder if the idea of empiricism isn't a, a methodology of control i think you even mentioned at the beginning that it's almost like a power trip uh, that people get on when they're using it. But I wanted to um, just let me, you know, the, finish the question here about, do you think that the upper classes, like the elite classes that are doing the colonizing, um, do you think they participate in magic? I mean, there's a lot of speculation that there is, uh, you, you know, that there's this Illuminati or that there's some kind of maybe dark magic that these guys are participating in, that they understand this magical system, that they're getting their information from the spirit world and that they're actually teaching the colonized this almost 
like inferior empiricism because if we knew magic ourselves and we would become individuated they couldn't control us you know is that a possibility so, do you see oh, yeah, it's definitely a possibility there's that famous um i forget who said it but millionaires don't believe in astrology billionaires do right yeah um, yeah and my career in london before i moved down here um i was occasionally useful not in a magical context in a career context to some people who are either very powerful or associated with very powerful people and so, I mean, Prince Philip, who just died, very into UFOs, very into UFOs and crop yeah. circles and so on, um, to the point that he sent his equerry to go and have a three-hour conversation with someone in Chelsea who claimed to be an alien, huh. um, like quite seriously involved in it. So right. I think there's a couple of things going on there. Um, the idea that the, the world is run by like a cabal of satanic pedophiles, that um, a secretly still President Trump is um, battling is... Uh, right. not good it's not a good read <laughs> yeah on what's going on um there's absolutely child trafficking and, and all the rest of it 100 percent, right uh but it the the error is in cohering it into a single narrative rather than a critique of history so for me i i, I come by my conspiracy theorizing from an anarchist perspective which mm -hmm. is that the predator class will always act in class interest, right? So that's like a Marxist take. Classes act in class interest. And we patently have a predator class. So I like to joke to people who dismiss conspiracy theory that Marxism is literally a conspiracy theory. I don't mean that the, the imposition, the apparent imposition of Marxism on the um, modern world is a conspiracy theory. I mean, Marx and Engels developed a conspiracy theory about how powerful people work. That's literally what it is, you know. Right. Um, so I come by it like the predator class acts in class interest, and we've just gone through the greatest concentration of billionaire wealth um, ever in the history of money. And we had in the US all those um, Instagram progressive politicians voting for it. So Bernie and AOC and everything. Grand stood for a little while and then voted for the greatest upward tra transfer of wealth in the history of mankind. That's the predator class operating acting in in class interest mm -hmm. so you do that at a planetary level and the people who are who deem to think that they are managing the world it's that techno solutionist thing know by now that this is some kind of real even at the level of using worldviews as weapons is a form of magic it's a form of because gaslighting is magic right like you're you're using thoughts to right. impact reality um, so when people say the world is run by evil magicians, yep. But that's that's operating on my definition of magic, which is that a, a good example of it is that, like you're using thoughts to have the world conform to what you want it to. Mm -hmm. And you can do that and be Ray Kurzweil. Um, you can be a hyper-materialist technocrat I mean, his belief system is beyond ludicrous. Like to, coming back to Bruno Latour, we've never been modern. That's the dumbest cosmology I've ever heard. doesn't matter. Um, so the world is absolutely run by um, sorcerers, uh, but they're not all meeting to sacrifice children to Moloch somewhere or anything, as far as I can tell. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But and, and more interestingly, coming back to are they in communication with spirits? I believe they are, and I believe it's in a possession sense because many of them at a fulfillment level don't think they're real. But I can tell you, professionally speaking, the being behind what's going on on planet Earth um, is, is, an active, is an ancient, active, <laughs> anti-life entity. And uh -huh. it's kind of like got finger puppets uh, in the form of humans, right? Okay. So uh, again, that's a spirit-based read of what's going on. And that's the maybe what the Gnostics called the Archons. Is that is that the yeah? I use the word Archon for it. There's there's uh -huh. all kinds of stuff. There's variants of it like Wetiko or, or what have you. Right. But you a um, a spirit a a spirit based framework allows you to allows for there to be hostility and malice and intention in the universe. Um, in a way that doesn't doesn't do two things doesn't fall into a gnostic dualism of like well we're in the battle we're in a fight with satan um or uh and this is the other thing the i mean i'm a conspiracy guy so i'm into it but the yeah. proliferation of conspiracies that's going on at the moment is 
because we're trying, we know, we experience that there are other forces moving shit around right now and we don't have the language for it. So the proximity of this being to um, the waking world, we, if you don't have a spirit language, like if you don't have a language to talk about spirits, then you do end up with something that looks like QAnon because it's, it's, it's a melt, like you're experiencing the fact that the world is uh, like, uh, is going through a, a major transition. Um, that's a nice way of putting it, right? Yeah. And if you don't have a language that's cosmic for that, then you end up with some of the, um, and and for the right reasons, like in the sense of your your experience is valid, but you end up with some, dare we say, very unhelpful ideas about about how the world's run because you only think that things can happen in physical reality. You only because you're experiencing stuff. Um, coming together in a highly suspicious trap that we say you 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 kind of have to go to a cabal of satanic pedophiles um right but we wouldn't have done that before we would have been aware that humans and other beings are in this sort of relational agentic flow which is very empowering when you get there it's not disempowering it's very empowering because what it does is brings you back to that you can literally you can change the universe at the level of your attention and perception. So you can adjust the field. It puts you, I don't like to use military or, or war terms for it. So it doesn't put you in battle with these beings. It's better than that. It, 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 um, you um, come to the defense and flourishing of the living field. So it's really empowering um, mm -hmm. when you look at what's going on. And it doesn't mean that the, uh, the stuff that's Going on. I mean, it's you know, it's open and shut. The the machinations of a particular Davos class that's going on at the moment, uh, open and shut, right? But that doesn't mean it's the only thing that's going on. And where did that come from? Where did that idea come from? The idea that you can techno solve the planet, right? Um, that's that's In, extra immortality that's, in a robot. That's, that's a, yeah, right. Um, so you kind of uh, it's really empowering to realize that you're in a much bigger game. Um, because otherwise there's, there's been a lot of despair and so on at the moment. And, and it's, and that's by design, like despair is part of the op, right? Despair yeah. and loneliness are part of the op. And, and oh, yeah. the good news there is that you can just, you can instantly defeat that. Like whew, you can, you can return to your state of perception and attention and focus on, on beauty. Um, like in the philosophical sense, um, not necessarily look at pornography, um, do what you want but i mean you you have uh wherever you are in a physical body that is always available to you because wherever you are is the universe it is the interface that co-creation moment that the hermetics talk about so it's brilliant once you get in there and it's certainly that's the only way through this right um because right. as we discussed you can't go back in, in a, you, there's a lot of reasons why you wouldn't want to. So let this be a moment. And I think it has been for a lot of people. They might articulate it differently. But I think the last 13 months, one of the side effects, I don't think um, the technocrats were expecting is that it has um, forced people into that update. It's forced people into updating how they experience reality. And that's like the good news. It's we get to be the thing that comes next. Um, right. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I guess one, one final question, maybe to wrap it around into the chaos protocols is, do you see, like, if we're, do we have to, you know, go into some kind of spiritual battle against the technocrats? Or, I mean, there was a, there was an element of chaos protocols where I, I, ca I would call it the trickster element where you were like, look, I mean, you know, things are just going to always be changing. And a lot of times things are going to be going to crap. And that's the time when you can jump in and figure out how to, to, to turn the disadvantage into your advantage. Yeah, and and so the advantage, it can. It's only selfish if you're selfish, right? So one of the long running metaphors I have on the blog is, um, which is half from Grant Morrison's comic series, The Invisibles. Um, our time on Earth is a rescue mission, which we fund with a salvage mission. So uh -huh. um, there, there are always opportunities in chaos. There are also at the coming up. There are hard lines that I don't think, for the sake of one's soul, they should cross. Like um, being contact tracers and all the rest of it. it doesn't yeah. matter if they're offering you a hundred thousand dollars. Like you do need to be aware in the salvage mission that you can lose your soul um, in an animist sense. Not only your soul go to hell, like soul loss and so on. 
Uh, but Chaos Protocols is called what it is, not because of Chaos Magic, but it is a collection of protocols of what to do in times of chaos. And so if you've spent the last 13 months coming to this new living awareness that we, I was just talking about, you're, you, you've had a reorganization of what you want in the short and medium term in your life. That nevertheless requires funding. So, I mean, I'm, I'm involved in permaculture and whatever down here, and I have a little permaculture farm and so on. That was always going to be it for me. I didn't do that last year. Yeah. Um, but a lot of people are thinking that way. And it's like, okay, well, how do you get that? That maybe wasn't what they wanted before. Uh, maybe they wanted something different. And, and that's the rescue mission, salvage mission. The rescue mission is the soul stuff. Like it's, um, what do you want to do with your time on earth? And the salvage mission is how you fund it. Right. Um, and so this is like, and, and magic is very good. And, and sorcery, having just said that sorcery is bad. Like magic will never judge. Um, and that that's around the world. Like spirits, you will find spirits who will assist you in, in doing anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so you're never, you're never like off the hook when it comes to morality um, as with anything else. So I like to think of it as funding a rescue mission with a salvage mission, which is how do I make money in this deranged system that or even better, especially at the moment, how do I extract out of this pathological system that is going away sufficient wealth and energy to, to participate in the flourishing of what comes next? Now, that might be a permaculture farm for people. It doesn't have to, it, you know, that's one of, of countless examples of like, how do I make the world better? Not on an obligatory sense, like, although you should do this anyway, if you can, like give money to charity and so on. Like, how does my being in the world, can I fund uh, 10,000 indigenous tree plantings? Can I, like, what, what is my version of the world being better mm -hmm. look like? And that's the rescue salvage mission thing. Yeah. And that's where we're at. Cause like literally what else are you going to do? And I think that's why so many people have woken up. Um, it's been a long two weeks to flatten the curve and we're not getting back. Right. right. So what else are you going to do? That's not, all those promises are gone. Um, and, and the incoming promises are, if anything, less satisfactory. So there, it seems to me there is the rescue mission and the salvage mission. Well, it sounds like a plan. I mean, one of the interesting <laughs> things, of, right? <laughs> one of the interesting things about the book for me was that, um, I mean, it basically is a, a very, very practical and almost an economics book. Like, look, Totally. This is the state of the world. You know, you're describing the economic situation. You're describing that education's become a waste of money. You're describing, you know, how do people get by? And then you're offering, like, learn how to read some tarot cards, you know, learn how to use the sigils, learn how to, you know, be able to get through this reality using some of these magical tools so you can have abundance in your life and you can make it through. And even when challenging, you know, even when times are challenging and learning yeah. how to, you know, perceive a reality where when times are challenging, you seek the advantage and you go for it. It's just so practical to me. It was kind of surprising because like, you know, we've just had this almost two hour long conversation about philosophy and metaphysics, basically, because you could certainly go there. But in the application of the magic, it's really quite practical. Like I want to have a healthy yeah. relationship. I need a couple more bucks. You know, I'd, I'd like to have a career that's, you know, decent and gets the job done. I, I want to leave the world a little bit of a better place. And, you know, or you can also use it, you know, you can use it to manipulate people too, but totally. You know, it's just fascinating to, to kind of get down to the nuts and bolts of it and, and read and learn more about it and just discover how practical it is actually. Um, and how it's just basically it's used to help people get by, you know, <laughs> nice one. always has been. Yeah. Well, sounds great, Gordon. Thanks for coming on. Do you want to let people know where they can find out uh, more about your work and where they can uh, listen to Rune Soup? Sure, absolutely. It's runesoup.com. Um, I have a Rune Soup Telegram group. Uh, that's basically it. I don't do socials anymore other than announce the shows because mm -hmm. talking about operating at the level of the field. Um, yeah, runesoup.com. You get everything. You get the show. If you're interested, there's a membership. Uh, we have a weekly show about um, fortune telling on every Thursday night. Uh, all of that's on the YouTube channel, but if yeah, runesoup.com. Sounds good. And I highly recommend it for anyone, especially if you're just, if you're magic curious, then check it out. If you've, if you've never really delved into it, because I, I mean, that's certainly Gordon has been 
uh, my go-to uh, probably for the last couple of years. I've just checked out the podcast, checked out uh, the blog every now and again, and I have slowly becoming invincible. I think I'm slowly learning nice. that this is a reality <laughs> that I, you know, that I can get tuned into. Uh, and uh, so, if you're skeptical, then check it out because uh, he really does a great job of explaining how this uh, magical universe can work, and has worked for many, many people in many cultures for thousands and thousands of years. So, thanks a lot for coming on the show and having this conversation. And uh, Good luck spreading the, the message of magic around the world. <laughs> Thanks very much. I'll let people know that uh, you've been listening to The Shift. I've been your host, Doug McKinty, and you can find uh, all of my stuff at www.theshiftnow.com. And I am I probably should go the way of just Telegram. I do have a Telegram group, but I am still trying to wade my way through Facebook. My personal page is actually probably a, a, the best place to go right now. So just look up Doug McKinty, although there is a Shift page. I'm still on YouTube uh, and uh, continuing to branch out to other uh, social media sites that are working. But the best place to go is is, uh, theshiftnow.com and sign up to the newsletter. And then I'll just send you weekly updates about everything that I produce. So thanks, everybody, for listening. And thanks again, Gordon. Great conversation. Anytime. Have a great day. Well, all right. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That was my conversation with Gordon White. Uh, I That went better than I had hoped that it was going to. I had him on because I've really been uh, kind of battling myself with this idea of magic and the spirit world and how to interact with the spirit world and where this all fits in with the big picture. I first heard Gordon on uh, the Higher Side Chats podcast, for those of you who know that one. And uh, Greg Carlwood has had Gordon on a couple of times. Uh, I think they've become friends. And I thought to myself initially, I thought, why is Greg talking to this guy? He's talking about all this crazy magic stuff, and I'm trying to listen to a conspiracy theory show. But as I listened to those episodes, and as I started to listen to what Gordon was saying, I really realized how important it is to at least be open-minded to this concept of magic and to be open-minded to this concept of the spirit world in terms of, you know, as our cognitive dissonance breaks down, and we become less and less plugged into the matrix, uh, you know, even with just something like the JFK assassination or what really happened on 9-11 and a lot of these political and economic topics that I've been getting into, you know, our minds get more and more open until suddenly these other completely different uh, alternative concepts around how is reality created, what's really going on here in this world become part of this bigger picture. So I wanted to bring Gordon on the show and really broaden the conversation about what it is to make the shift in terms of how can we incorporate some of this uh, understanding that we're living in a living universe, uh, that there's a multidimensional reality, and that every other culture in the history of the world previous to colonization has had the spirit world and interacting with the spirit world as an integral part of their belief system and how they worked and how they got along on a practical day-to-day level in terms of understanding how to live their life and making choices, important choices about their lives. So, um, and what, uh, no better person that I have found to have come on besides Gordon White. He's really uh, dedicated his life to understanding what he calls chaos magic is the particular kind of magic that I think he practices mostly, but he has studied all kinds of different magical and mystical traditions from around the world. His podcast, Rune Soup, has guests that are knowledgeable about a, such a huge variety of different metaphysical systems. Uh, and he has really gone and he has plumbed the depths of what it means to have this more indigenous belief system or this magic-based belief system where the spirits are real, where everything is living, and, uh, and where we can interact with this spirit world in order to manifest a, a, a better reality for ourselves, to manifest abundance, to manifest happiness, to manifest health. Um, and so I was real happy to have him on and be able to really kind of get down and dirty with some of these concepts that are really challenging, I know, first from my own personal experience, for those of us that have been raised inside the colonized mind to uh, really break free of that Western scientific materialism 
that materialistic reductionism that we were all taught growing up and start to think, well, what if we live in a world, in a multidimensional world where there are literally spirits and gods and beings uh, and demons that we can interact with through magic or through indigenous ceremony or through psychedelics uh, and we can learn how the universe works from them and through them. And we can create the reality, our everyday, day-to-day -day reality, by working with these spirits from beyond the veil, right? Um, and what a fantastic conversation, actually. Just really diving deep with him about the concept of the colonized mind. Because once colonized, it's so difficult to break out of it. But then we were able to get into the fact that all other cultures in the history of the world have had this belief system based on this multidimensional living universe where there are these beings on the other side uh, that we can communicate with and that there are technologies that all of these different cultures had developed uh, to communicate with these entities and to gain knowledge from these entities. And even the idea that knowledge comes from these multidimensional beings as opposed to coming from thinking and using reason and deducing from the materialist world around us, that there's this other way, this other epistemology. Um, that was fascinating, trying to break free again from the colonized mind. And then we were able to kind of get into this concept of racism, which I really appreciated because I'm frustrated frustrated with the conversations about race that we're having in the colonized world today, where it seems to me like people working on their quote-unquote anti-racism means how do we assimilate people of color into the corporate patriarchy <laughs> where they can have equal access to this incredible culture that the white Europeans have created uh, that, uh, you know, I mean, it's... Uh, it's just it's just mind-boggling to me. I feel like when I'm talking to some of these people, they're they're so clearly white supremacists while they're telling me how anti-racist they're being. And and to have the conversation with Gordon where we were really able to kind of say based on both of our experiences that uh really dealing with other cultures, with cultures of color, with cultures that have yet to be colonized from, from your heart in a good way requires this level of humility and the arrogance that colonized people have towards them, it's almost, it's subconscious. It's so subconscious that the only way you have to get involved and then you're going to make mistakes and you have to be humble and you apologetic when you do. Uh, it's so challenging to break down the barriers of the colonized mind and um, doing this serious deep work of decolonization, which goes all the way into uh, understanding and recognizing at least the possibility or at least respecting that many of these other cultures do include uh, that there is this spirit world and that their culture revolves around interacting with the spirit world in this way. And so um, Gordon and I were really able to dive into a lot of these, not just the concept of the colonized mind, but also this concept of racism uh, that I think is really important because, uh, you know, if, if, if colonized people really don't really want to stop being racist, if they want to stop being supremacist, what they should be doing is learning from indigenous peoples, uh, learning from these different cultures from all over the world and giving them equal respect, not discounting, oh, the superstitions of those people that haven't been civilized yet and who need to be assimilated into the corporate job where they can make, you know, $100,000 a year and join the rest of us, <laughs> right? The anti-racism means uh, we don't mind if a person of color enters into uh, our corporate <laughs> patriarchal hierarchy and makes it, you can make it to the top, no matter what your skin color is, you can make it to the top uh, you could, you might be able to become president one day or the CEO of that corporation because we are so anti-racist. Um, it just kind of, it just kind of drives me crazy, actually, the way the whole conversation is going. So to have that conversation with Gordon and to really kind of get to the heart of, of this understanding about what racism is, I mean, just the, the scientism perspective is in its, and of itself uh, really racist. To have the open mind 
to be able to respect these other cultures is so important if we're going to move forward as a human species, even if you're not willing to suddenly start casting spells or, uh, you know, pursuing some kind of uh, spiritual ceremony to uh, to uh, cross the veil and, and enter into the spirit world. Uh, having that respect is so important. And, and, you know, just the open-mindedness to be able to say, hey, you know, I don't know. I don't know what reality is, and your reality is just as good as ours, as good as mine is, right? Somebody else's reality. That was another great part of the conversation that I really enjoyed was this um, this lack of judgment that a lot of these people that are engaged in these kinds of spiritual, mystical, magical practices uh, lose judgment, and, and they lose uh, they lose that need to to feel like one way is better than the other. They're completely happy that uh, one person can have their way, and another person. Uh, can choose their own way, and that's completely fine. I mean, just in terms of what's going on with the vaccinations right now, right? I mean, so many people who are getting vaccinated think everyone should get vaccinated. It's That's something that I think from the indigenous ways that I've learned, it doesn't really even enter into the mind. Like, you know, somebody will choose to get a vaccination, somebody else, that's not their way. They're going to do a ceremony or they're going to they're gonna seek a different path. Uh, for healing or dealing with disease. It's um, it's just a different way of thinking, and I think it's a big part of what it means to make the shift. So big thanks for Gordon for coming on to the program and having that conversation with me. Uh, I hope you guys learned a lot, even if uh, the idea of communing with the spirit world is, is just outside of, of your realm. Uh, I do urge you to kind of take what Gordon said uh, to your heart a little bit about that concept of becoming invincible. I mean, we all have cognitive dissonance. A lot of us, uh, you know, when we're talking about coronavirus these days or 9-11 or JFK or whatever it might be, and it's so frustrating to talk to these other people, and we can clearly perceive no matter what facts we put in front of their face, they're not going to listen to us. It actually is the same, I think, I mean, I still suffer from cognitive dissonance when I'm talking to somebody uh, about the spirit world, or when I'm, you know, I did play around with my tarot deck to prepare for this interview, to just go like, okay, let's do it, let's see, <laughs> let's see how this works. Um, and so when Gordon talks about becoming invincible, you know, he invites you to play around with that tarot deck or to remember that time that something strange happened, that you saw something in the sky that, you know, may probably was a UFO, right? But then you kind of forgot about it in the weeks and months after because it was just something that was so strange, something so outside of, of your paradigm of belief that you uh, you weren't willing to hold on to that memory. And so he asks you to know, you know, remember those strange things that happen because that's what connects you to the other side. And once you take, once you, once you remember, once you remember that time that you thought you saw that spirit at the foot of your bed, right? And you start to go, wait a minute, that really happened to me. Then suddenly your individual experience becomes uh, the primacy. It becomes your path. And you don't have to have some kind of objective worldview that you impose on everybody else that is the truth, right? Uh, and Gordon calls that becoming invincible. So I really like that about what he had to say as well. Um, so I urge all of you to learn more. Uh, go to his website, www.runesoup.com. You can check out all of his, uh, all of his interviews on the podcast, Rune Soup. Um, and there is just so much incredible information. I, he has spoken with so many different people from all over the world, uh, people doing different indigenous ceremonies, but also people that are uh, doing uh, Ayurvedic medicine or Ayurvedic astrology or different Taoists that he's spoken to, uh, different people from different European lineages, um, you know, and any kind of magic that you can imagine wanting to dabble with, whether it's the tarot cards or working with sigils or casting spells or summoning demons, uh, Gordon's the guy to go to. So again, check it out, www.runesoup.com. And of course, uh, for everything shift related, please check out my website. That is theshiftnow.com. Uh, I've got hours of free content up there. Uh, you can also go and subscribe if you want to get the full-length interviews. Uh, I usually take about 30% of each interview off and uh, hold it back for subscribers. It's only 6 bucks a month, so 
uh, for that. You can get the full feature length interview uh, or you can just sign up to the newsletter and I'll send you all the new stuff that I produce every week. Uh, right now I've got not just the shift, but I've got behind the line, uh, which is my COVID specific show. Uh, still doing the psychology of lockdown, and I'm hoping to add maybe even a crypto and technocracy series, which will be more politics related, so the shift can kind of stay uh, on this health, this health kick, this health and spirituality kick that I've been on. It makes it a little more YouTube friendly. Uh, so the other, the other more controversial shows, I'll keep on the website, and uh, I'll just. Uh, Put the shift up on uh, on Facebook and YouTube and and Twitter, where uh, the censorship is is getting kind of kind of worse by the day. I'm gonna keep it a little bit safer that way. So, uh, www.theshiftnow.com and get all that information. And um, my conversation next week is going to be with Charlie Robinson. He is the author of the Octopus of of Global Control. So we're gonna get uh, back to our roots in, in conspiracy theory, and we're going to talk about uh, a lot of the history of, of politics and economics and uh, the bank, the central banking cabal and the cartel and uh, how, just exactly how they control the media. Uh, the basics, the nitty gritty of conspiracy theory, but uh, also all of that coming to the forefront now in the age of, of the coronavirus pandemic. So stay tuned for that. So we'll see you all next week. And thanks again so much for listening. Really had a great conversation and uh, stay tuned for all the good stuff that's coming up in the future. You guys have a great day and take care of yourselves. And uh, we'll talk to you again soon.